Let's see. So I've been in, uh, inter interested in designing code for uh, a really long time that I, as a uh, seventh grader, I designed my, uh, my school's logo. Uh, it is embarrassing enough that I choose not to show it here. Um, in uh, eighth grade, I sold my first piece of software, a really cheesy uh, stock market game, but at $250, that was an amazing sum for an eighth grader. Um, and I will also not show that because it's um, suitably cheesy. Uh, but it wasn't until I met uh, John, or I saw John do a lecture uh, at Carnegie Mellon during my uh, senior year in uh, design school, uh, that I really saw a way to kind of reconcile these two disciplines in a way that made sense. You know, that I thought I would do something like interface design or uh, something that would um, sort of make use of these two disciplines. But, um, you know, instead John was, uh, as he mentioned, collecting these people who were, who were hybrids of, you know, visual, en uh, visual artists and engineers and, and so on and putting them into this place called the Aesthetics and Computation Group. And uh, I got started there looking at uh, information design. So what What's the, uh, what makes sense as far as doing uh, information design in the context of code? And so I would build systems like this where um, instead of, you know, as a designer where you sit and, uh, you know, s set every bit of type and move every, you know, s uh, small thing into place, uh, instead, you know, s put together a series of rules um, and from that the composition will, uh, will emerge. And that, you know, so this was interesting. This was 1998. Um, interesting enough, but the problem is, what I found was that most people were responding to the fact that this was, you know, it was moving, and there was type, and it's 3D, and it's round. People love things that are round. Um, and so it only kind of went, you know, goes so far. It, it actually turns out winds, uh, that it's uh, suitable for film use. So here's Tom Cruise checking his Gmail with it uh, in, in 2054. Um, and so, you know, fast forward a couple years, and I was uh, trying to find something that was going to be meaty enough for uh, my PhD work, and I was really fascinated by the human genome. And the human genome project, they had just finished the first uh, draft, and there were these diagrams like this that tried to explain different aspects of, uh, you know, genomic variation and uh, so on. And I thought, you know, this would be interesting. Those are all the diagrams of the exact same data. Could we actually put them together into a single space? and using a little bit of interaction, be able to move between each of these. So here's the more literal one with the percentages. Um, here, moving into 3D so I can see these transitions between these different blocks. Um, adding another set of data into that third dimension, and then when I actually look at it from the top, I have a completely different diagram. And so basically just trying to put together these different ways of looking at this um, you know, really complicated data. Um, and the, you know, so this was 2004, and around that time, um, in parallel, the other project that we were doing was uh, this thing called processing. And uh, processing was started with uh, Casey Reese, who is a, uh, another uh, collaborator at the, um, at the Media Lab. Uh, and the thing that we're trying to do with processing was have a very simple programming environment so that people who were uh, you know, artists and designers could get up and running with code and uh, people who were already familiar with code could make visual things very easily and very quickly. And um, that continued to grow. So uh, we're at a point now where um, this month we'll have a couple hundred thousand people who actually um, will be using the software. And you know, so that's really exciting as far as we have a bunch of, uh, we've been able to you know, hopefully encourage just an incredible number of, of hybrids in this, in this regard. Um, we have a really serious mission statement. So the processing project seeks to ruin the careers of talented designers by tempting them away from their usual tools into the world of programming and computation. Uh, similarly, the project is designed to turn engineers and computer scientists to less gainful employment as artists and designers. And so, um, and we've been successful, I love this. Um, and, and probably many of you in the room, you know, uh, processing or otherwise can certainly uh, relate to this, uh, this statement. But I don't think there's anything more exciting than being able to say, uh, take somebody who's an artist or designer and be able to give them uh, a new skill set, or for them to be able to find their way to this new school, uh, skill set that extends the way that they work and the, the way that they build things, and vice versa for uh, an artist or for a technologist to be able to find their voice within, uh, within art and design. Uh, just a, a week or two, we uh, released the third major, uh, major version of the software, and it's just continued to grow into um, you know, really an amazing uh, kind of thing as far as the community uh, behind it, I could spend a great deal of time just simply talking about that. Um, and I use this software to uh, build a lot of my own work as well, and, it, and if nothing else, as a, as a starting point. Um, one such project, this was uh, 2009, a, a friend of mine who studied genetics was uh, telling me about how Darwin's um, 
uh, origin of species actually changed a great deal over, over time. So, you know, that he was actually kind of struggling with the theory and actually backed off the theory and refined it over time um, during the course of the uh, several editions that he, he wrote. And so I thought, you know, that's amazing as far as, you know, it's not typically how we think of science that um, we think, you know, the scientists go and think big thoughts and then they come back and like give us the answers. Uh, and instead here we could have, you know, Darwin, um, you know, sitting with Word and kind of doing track changes and trying to figure out his theory of evolution. Um, so here's all six editions of the book just, you know, uh, shown with that track changes version. This was a piece of software, you know, so it's about a million words of text. And so how do you get through a million words and how do you put this in front of somebody so that they can um, just start playing with this, uh, with this data set? Um, that one was a little bit uh, intense. So uh, in order to show it for an exhibition, I built this version, which basically just takes all of that text and over time keeps adding each successive uh, version of the book. And so I can zoom into different points and see where he's, uh, where he's changed things. You know, so things like uh, survival of the fittest um, didn't actually show up until the fifth edition. So that was after about 10 years of the, uh, uh, the text being in existence. And so we can track some of these things out. And as far as doing projects like this, you know, and this was a, um, a print version of it. But there's, there's something difficult about uh, projects like this where it kind of exists in its own space and you know, for people who are already interested in this kind of work and want to think about data and uh, design and so on. And so um, in 2010, I started a, uh, a firm because I wanted to um, work on projects at, at a larger scale. These are uh, several of the wonderful people I'm working with. Um, and you know, one of the first projects that kind of demonstrates that was this project we did for Thomson Reuters about China. And so Thomson Reuters had come to us to, and said, you know, we want to understand how China works and we want to show how power in China um, actually uh, acts and how different people interact with one another and, you know, how these structures play out and um, how Chinese politics work. Um, you know, small, small project. Um, and so uh, the end result was this uh, tablet-based application where we're trying to uh, show connections between people. This is the social view that is a uh, kind of the soft connections in between, you know, so Xi Jinping's social network here, his Facebook friends, uh, Hu Jintao. Um, and uh, on the other hand, this institutional view, this is a, you know, the more structured, you know, sort of hierarchic versions of, on paper, what, uh, what the relationships between these people are supposed to be. And so, you know, really just taking a phenomenal amount of information so that, you know, the, to the extent that we're in this information age, we hear about big data, things like that. I think designers are essentially our last line of defense between, you know, we have this, uh, all of this information and we need ways of actually understanding it. And we need lots of different kinds of designers and writers and so on. And so what I'm trying to do is get these people together to um, tackle really tricky uh, problems like this. Um, so, you know, behind the scenes, it's tens of thousands of entities and 30,000 relationships and 1.5 million words. And, um, you know, the raw data looks something like this. This is actually a small fraction of what uh, went into the final piece. Uh, we never want to show somebody this. You know, it's kind of like, oh, it's big data. It's complex. Congratulations. Um, and so, you know, through a course of, you know, a couple iterations, we have something more like this that starts giving it some, uh, some structure. And then, you know, finally where we wind up with the... Uh, the final there. Um, so that's uh, online, it's just china.fathom.info. It's a uh, free uh, resource that's out there. Um, but I'll wrap up with a, um, a more recent project that uh, we've been uh, doing. We were contacted by the um, Clinton Foundation and the Gates Foundation and that they wanted to do a look at uh, the progress of women and girls over the last 20 years. You know, so dating back to um, 1995, what is the, uh, you know, what are measures that we can actually uh, track in terms of change and, and how, uh, how women and girls are doing? Uh, and so a very simple lead off visualization, this is taking uh, just gender gap and uh, looking at the gender gap in workforce participation. Um, you know, each one of these lines is a country. I can get these in a, um, see what country that is and play that back starting in 1995 and running it all the way through to, uh, through to 2012. And this is the gaps. And so ever so slightly, we can see you know, some of these gaps actually uh, closing. So there's progress, but you know, obviously not enough. Um, we can organize by uh, how low to, you know, the low to high in terms of the raw percentage of the number of women in, uh, in the workforce. And so here's something where we can take you know, a fairly obtuse uh, Excel spreadsheet and put it in front of people and they can start engaging with this data and, and looking at it. 
Uh, and then this plays out across uh, other interactive works and um, uh, video that complements that and also you know, some more basic um, sort of you know, poll quotes. Um, those kinds of things include you know, these uh, small shareable objects. So you know, the US is one of nine countries worldwide that doesn't provide paid maternity leave. So that's, that's worldwide. So it's the US and a bunch of island nations that don't do paid maternity leave. Um, yeah, so proud. Um, 200 million fewer women have internet access uh, than men in the developing world. So uh, think about what the internet means as far as what it is as a economic driver, what it is as a social driver. Um, so if you know, women are starting a step behind in terms of access to the internet, especially in the developing world, what, what sort of impact is that gonna have in terms of you know, how that plays out over many years? Uh, one in three women suffers physical or sexual violence. You've probably heard uh, this sort of a stat. One of the things we're always trying to do too is we have this about the data section. So we're always linking back to the primary sources. So even though this is you know, something that you can post on Twitter or Facebook or whatever else, we're always linking back to the raw uh, data. And you know, um, this works as far as these you know, very simple shareable kinds of things, but we also have to have that basis underneath it. And so uh, in this particular project, we have you know, 850,000 data points. It's almost 1,000 different indicators across 190 countries in 20 years. Um, the data was delivered something like this. So this is a, a quarter million rows or so in a spreadsheet. That's fascinating. Um, along with that, uh, what we would do is start building tools that help us understand different, uh, different aspects of the data. So this is an internal tool that we did for uh, you know, some of our, so that more people in the office could actually start analyzing the data than just, um, just the people writing code. Uh, we also did this one, which just looks at you know, the density of how much information we have in different, different areas. Um, and then started developing stories, you know, so really simple, just here are some bar charts that, uh, you know, there's something interesting happening in terms of the uh, number of entrepreneurs in different, uh, different regions or uh, understanding gaps in, uh, gaps in schooling. Um, and then any time that we start seeing something like that, we're going to go back to the, uh, the primary source and, you know, reports from the WHO and the UN and the World Bank uh, so that we know that we're we're not extrapolating strange things from, you know, from this spreadsheet. Uh, you know, but like I said, we need this to work at several different levels. So again, kind of going back to those very first pieces that I showed, um, how does this, you know, this set of visualization work sit within a broader context of you know, who's going to use it, who's the audience, what's the context, are they on their phone, are they sitting at their desk? Um, and the, uh, the clients, what they wanted us to do was reach millennials and policymakers, because you know, those are like the same. <laughs> Um, sort of thing, and uh, and so we needed things that kind of spoke with with different voices, and um, the way that that plays out, you know, this is a uh, a story on uh, child brides, and so this you know just astonishing number, so 20, almost 26 million child brides live in India, and seeing different factors that um, play a role in that, as far as the number of girls who are enrolled in high school, the number of girls under 18 who are married, whether that uh, country has a policy on that and then the number of girls under 18 who have given birth. And so we can look at that across, uh, across different countries and get you know, just these, uh, the relative sizes of um, these numbers. But going a step deeper than that, we can also you know, uh, understand where that data is coming from. So you know, that 25.9 million women in, uh, in India is a little bit shocking, and so we can actually go back to that resource and you know, uh, dig in a little bit further and try and understand uh, more about what that actually means. Or if you want to take something like that high school enrollment number, um, let's now look at that across um, you know, the entire world. So we have this map view, which is you know, sort of the bottom layer of all of this, where every last bit of the data, so all 850,000 of those data points are actually available within this, uh, within this view. And so, uh, you know, and then as I mentioned, different contexts. So here's uh, you know, looking at it within uh, you know, a mobile setting, so on your, on your phone. But it doesn't have to be this, uh, you know, sort of fancier, uh, your latest iPhone 6S Plus, you know, WebGL 3D globe kind of thing. Um, this one here is one of my favorites. So here's math scores for uh, women age 16, and here's the number, of, uh, compared to the number of uh, graduates within uh, math or fields essentially that use math. And so you can't really argue with this. This isn't a matter of like 5% or 10% or something like that. It's just really um, right there. And we open up all the data so that uh, folks can make use of it because you know, mostly we just want people engaging with it. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. It's uh, just noceilings.org. 
And uh, thanks very much for your time.